This is footage of what some describe as the forthcoming Chinese war machine. But is this really the case? Another example of bad intel or worse, bad faith reporting? The reality of the matter is that China's military investments have exploded over the past few decades. Meanwhile, global opinions of the communist regime have largely gone down the drain. So is this new expansion just another step towards global superpowerdom or the end of Western economic superiority as we know it? In a world where everyone has their opinions, the truth is often way more complicated than the news wants us to think. You're watching the Geopolitics in Conflict show, and my name is Elizabeth Ann Stewart. This is a major purge underway of senior military leadership, particularly in charge of what they call the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force, is the old name for a function which is now principally to do with uh, nuclear weapons. As China prepares to add more military might to its navy, Asian superpower is expected to launch two multi-role naval warships, adding muscle to its new generation of aircraft carrier strike groups. So here's the deal. It's simply impossible to deny China's military spending has increased exponentially. Think about this. In the year 2000, China was spending just 22.2 billion on its military, or 1.8% of the country's GDP. By 2020, that number had ballooned to just shy of 258 billion. That's a 1,072% increase in just two decades. And regardless of whether you feel China is the biggest international threat in history or just another growing superpower looking to extend its global reach, it's safe to assume that this investment is no accident. Couple this with some of the other recent developments coming out of Beijing, and it's easy to understand why economists, politicians, and military advisors are pointing their fingers at the red dragon. Still, pointing fingers doesn't make you right. So what exactly is on the table here? Well, as of this recording, the U.S. Department of Defense has yet to release its 2023 China Military Power Report, but last year's report provides some eye-opening information. For starters, it claims that China is determined to amass and expand its national power so that it can transform international systems and make them more favorable to its national interests. This determinism is coupled with a rise in coercive military behavior, including aggression throughout the Indo-Pacific region. In short, China wants to take a position at the center of the international stage a space that's currently occupied by the United States. If necessary, it may be prepared to do some uncomfortable things to achieve that. Now, before you get all up in arms, let's apply a grain of salt to this report. Obviously, the US has a vast interest in painting the CCP as some sort of international boogeyman. In doing so, it can rally other countries to its side, more easily lobby for trade embargoes and tariffs, and genuinely position itself as the international good guy. Yet the United States and other Western nations know all too well that condemning Chinese expansion, be it economic or political, is the pot calling the kettle black. So what, pray tell, is the US pointing at? Well, for starters, China's Communist Party has invested nearly 30 billion in overseas port infrastructure projects since 2001. Many of these ports are located in low to mid-income nations, which some suggest that China plans to bully their way into massive network of global military bases disguised as commercial installations. According to a report from Aid Data, which analyzes government aid expenditures on international development projects, the CCP has funded 123 different projects at 78 ports in 46 countries. In most cases, this has been done via loans and grants provided by, by Beijing or state-owned companies. But before we jump on the anti-Beijing bandwagon, let's get some historical context regarding China's rise from a largely agrarian state to an international powerhouse. Spoiler alert, the United States plays a very big role. 
You see, after the Chinese Communist Party's victory in the Chinese Civil War in 1949, Mao Zedong established the People's Republic of China. Mao's opponent, Chiang Kai-shek, retreated to the island of Taiwan with his remaining nationalist forces. Under his leadership, Taiwan developed into a separate and self-governing entity with its own government and military, distinct from the CCP. The mainland, however, disputes their sovereignty. During the post-war era, China's economy was largely closed off from the rest of the world, and the country followed a strict command economy model. And while the military played a crucial role in consolidating the power of the CCP, it was not exactly a force to be reckoned with from a global standpoint. Then, in the late 1970s, China initiated a series of economic reforms that helped open it up to international trade and investment. The U.S. President Nixon visited in 1972, marking the beginning of a completely new relationship between China and the West. Special economic zones were then established to attract foreign capital and technology. This, of course, led to a massive level of modernization and growth across all sectors, including the military. Then, in 1978, President Jimmy Carter announced that the United States would formally recognize the Communist People's Republic and sever its diplomatic relations with Taiwan. This helped relations between the two countries to normalize, and American companies soon began to see China as a vast source of cheap and relatively unregulated labor. In no time, it became the manufacturing center of the world, while Western citizens watched their job prospects and economic mobility deteriorate. But by the 2000s, that wasn't the only thing deteriorating. Trade tensions, concerns over intellectual property theft, disputes in the South China Sea, human rights issues, and issues related to technology and security soured Chinese-U.S. relations even more than ever. This was further exacerbated by the Trump trade war in 2018, despite the fact that many Americans championed the move. Of course, the very existence of Taiwan has hung like a shadow over both countries. Indeed, the United States maintains unofficial relations with Taiwan and has sold arms to the island to support its defense, mainly defense against the CCP. However, China still considers Taiwan a part of its territory and has not ruled out the use of force to reunify the country. This is one of the things that we've been keeping the closest eye on as the United States tends to like to get involved in conflicts that may or may not have anything to do with it. Which brings us to the country's current leadership. Xi Jinping, China's president, is widely recognized as a shrewd and, when necessary, somewhat brutal leader. Throughout his reign, he has alternated between autocrat and populist, communist and ardent capitalist, multiple times over. Ask either his supporters or his detractors, and they'll tell you he knows precisely what he intends to do with his growing military influence. The problem is, does anyone else? Trade wars and economic differences are not uncommon among nations, especially those as agriculturally and politically different as the U.S. and China. So why does China have such a terrible reputation among its mostly Western trade partners? For one, China's electronic manufacturing industry has long relied on reverse engineering to develop its products. Though this has changed and now they are starting to develop their own products. This all started in the 1980s and 1990s when China faced a huge foreign exchange shortage and could not import the latest tech from developed countries. Through various means, including high-level corporate espionage, which the U.S. does too, by the way, and so do many other countries, China simply got very good at copying, or as some would say, stealing other countries' tech. Like I said, this is not unique to China. This happens all over the world, including the U.S. For instance, China reverse engineered as much of its high-speed railway from technology imported from Japan, France, and Germany. Over time, thanks to government funds and sheer ingenuity, the Chinese managed to create their own system, which some say surpassed the original technology. In this way, many people accuse American companies of doing business in China of supercharging the country's technological capabilities. This is probably not wrong. 
This includes venture capital firms, which some say directly contributed to China's military expansion and its huge technological advancements. Indeed, as with trains and other tech, anything China gets its hands on seems destined to be copied and ultimately improved upon. The theory that China may be reverse engineering military tech is pretty well supported. Indeed, analysts point to vast improvements in Chinese naval vessels, drones, stealth jets, and more, all of which happened within the last decade or so. The same experts highlight the United States exports of machinery like computers as well as advanced aircraft and spacecraft, all of which could potentially make their way into Chinese hands for replication. In fact, the Chinese Navy has already overtaken that of the United States, and the Chinese Air Force is ramping up to do the same. Concerns were further raised in 2021 when Beijing began constructing fields filled with at least 300 new intercontinental ballistic missile silos. Just recently, the Pentagon predicted that the country will have an arsenal of 1,500 warheads, triple today's figure by 2035. This brings us back to the matter of this global port infrastructure. The CCP has invested heavily in overseas port projects, with a total expenditure of almost 30 billion between 2000 and 2023. This massive investment is a part of what the country calls the Belt and Road Initiative, which China obviously sees as a way to extend its reach and influence. And there's nothing wrong with that. And while this could be economical in nature, some argue that these new ports are all about securing military installations, challenging the U.S. Navy over sea lanes, and, according to some, finally retaking Taiwan. And in order to get an idea of where these bases might turn up, it's helpful to look at where China is currently investing. West Africa is the most notable here, with billions of Chinese dollars locked up in places like Ghana, Cameroon, and Sierra Leone. This is followed closely by parts of the Middle East, Sri Lanka, and less developed areas like Cambodia and the Philippines. There are even some hints of 1950s USSR tactics, with over 100 million invested in Cuba's port of Santiago, as well as nearby Venezuela and Colombia. Whatever the ultimate purpose behind the Belt and Road Initiative, the implications for the world as we know it are staggering. But in what way? It's possible that China simply wants to enjoy a larger piece of the global economic pie. This would be difficult for any capitalist country to criticize, even if they have a vested interest in ensuring that it doesn't happen. Another option is that China wants to take over the world, from an economic perspective, that is, by carving out inroads towards sea and air dominance. It could indeed reshape global trade in a way that gives it the most power, money, and influence. Finally, it's impossible for anyone to ignore the potential military implications of China's expansion. After all, even if the goal is economic, one has to wonder if the US and UK will simply sit by and watch it happen. Of course, this military theory is further supported by China's recent efforts to collect new allies. Indeed, where they were once considered a sort of global pariah, they now have renewed diplomatic relations with Russia, Iran, Thailand, Malaysia, Turkey, Kuwait, and Pakistan, among many others. The point is, what was once dubbed the empire with no friends has suddenly found a lot more shoulders to lean on. Ultimately, the surge in China's military spending, its expanding global influence, and its overseas investments presented us with a complex and evolving geopolitical landscape. While China's growing military capabilities have raised concerns and sparked international debate, its intentions remain too multifaceted to pin down. In that way, the Belt and Road Initiative, whatever its true purpose, has been a success. What remains to be seen is just what sort of success that will be. Meanwhile, Western leaders are either determined to label China's expansion as the end of the world or a harmless economic enterprise, only time will tell and the clock is ticking fast.